Hi, I'm Bart Polson, and this video is a review of the practice final exam for Behavioral Science 3010, that's Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences at Utah Valley University. Um, in this section, we're going to start at uh, item number 51 of the exam. It says here that committing a type 2 error uh, is defined as well, a type 2 error is a uh, false negative. A type 1 is a false positive. A type 2 is a false negative. Um, and let's see what it says here. It says, including too many individuals in the sample. I have never heard of that being an error, and it certainly has nothing to do with a false negative. So scratch A. B, not rejecting, that is, retaining the null hypothesis when it should have been rejected. That... Um, so retaining the null hypothesis is a negative finding, so you decide that there's nothing going on. When it should have been rejected because there really is a lot of correlation in the, in the population or differences in the population. So uh, that is a false negative. B is a very wordy way of saying a false negative. That is a type 2 error. So 51 is B. Uh, C, setting the rejection region too low, yeah, you know, that has to do with the selection of an alpha. That's, that's a separate issue. And then D, rejecting the null hypothesis when it should have been retained. Uh, that is a false positive and a type 1 error. So um, a little confusing. All right, 52 here. After a researcher rejects the null hypothesis, um, okay, so you've rejected the null hypothesis. She needs to be aware of, well, the possibility that it's a false positive. Um, so if you reject the null hypothesis, you do need to be aware that it still could be due to random error. And so A, a type 1 error, that's the that's the a thing for false positive. Anyhow, um, yeah, you don't have to be aware of a false negative because you've rejected it. You don't have a negative. You have a positive here. And so you need to be aware of a false positive. So that's type 1. So the answer is A. 53, a two-sample t-test, uh, that's something that you use to compare, well, it says here, A, is conducted when A, when the independent and dependent variables are nominal or ordinal data. No, actually, that's not true. In fact, that's when you would use a chi-square test, which we haven't talked about in this class yet. B, when three or more samples are being compared. Well, that's actually when you would want to use an analysis of variance, probably a one-way analysis of variance or even a factorial. C, when the population mean and sample mean are known. That would be a one-sample t-test or z-test, um, are you comparing a single sample against a population. So it must be D when two sample means are being compared, and that is the correct answer. You use the two-sample t-test to compare two sample means to each other. That's pretty easy. 54. In a two-sample t-test, we established our critical value as plus 1.96. Uh, okay. By the way, that means that's not going to be exactly uh, an alpha of 05 because on a t-test, the critical values are going to be a little farther out than on a z-test. In any case, we have a we have a critical region here. Critical value of plus 1.96. Oh, by the way, that must mean it's also one-tailed because it's only positive. Um, our observed value, the test value, that is the one that we got from the sample statistics, was calculated as plus 2.10. So it's a more extreme value than the critical value. Uh, the critical value is plus 1.96, so we said that anything above that, anything to the right, um, is considered statistically significant. So this always means, A, the test results supported what the researcher wants to prove. No, that, actually that's never the case. The results may be consistent with what you want to do, um, but you know that that's a really big inferential leap, so we're going to ignore that one. B, p-values are high. Actually, they're going to be pretty low because they're going to be in the critical regions so are going to be small enough that we um, reject the null hypothesis. Okay, see the null hypothesis is retained. No, because our calculated value is more extreme than the critical value. The, the 2.10 is, is bigger than our 1.96, so that's not true. And then D, the null hypothesis is rejected. Yes, D is the correct answer because our, our calculated or observed value from our sample puts the uh, sample mean into the region of rejection because it's past the cutoff point, the, past the critical value. And so we say, no, this is more uh, variation than we would expect by chance. So that works like that. So 54 is D. 55, a chi-squared test. Remember, it's not chi, it's chi. Um, a chi-squared test is conducted, well, when the independent and dependent variables are nominal uh, or ordinal data. Actually, that is correct. When you are um, 
because you can't really do the means and stuff. So that is when you're looking at the distributions of categorical variables. So A is the correct answer. That's when you would want to do a chi-square test. Um, three or more samples? No, that's if you're comparing means and analysis of variance. C, when the population mean and sample mean are known. No, you don't, you don't do chi-square in that case. Uh, that would be a, 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 you know, a t-test or a z-test for means. And then D, when two sample means are being compared, no, that's the t-test that we talked about in the last one. So 55 is A. You do a chi-square test where the independent and dependent variables are nominal or ordinal data. That's when they're categorical data. 56. If we use alpha as the criteria or critical value for the maximum probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis, oh, this gets confusing, then in an ANOVA, oh, by the way, that first part just says we're using an alpha. So we have a null hypothesis, and we set off a uh, part of the, uh, for instance, normal distribution where, or the T distribution where we say, you know, this far away is too extreme, and we're not going to accept that as random variation. Okay, that just it says we have a region of rejection in the distribution. Fine. Then in an ANOVA, that means an analysis of variance, uh, that's where you're usually comparing the, the means of three or more groups. Uh, where alpha is 0, 01, so you're, you're, you've chosen a 1% risk of false positive, assuming the null hypothesis is true. And the calculated p-value is 0. 0.20. So the value that we were looking for was 0, 01. We wanted something with a p-value less than that. And our p-value is actually 0. 0.20, which is much higher. Uh, then we should... A, retain the null hypothesis. Yes, that is correct because uh, the the p-value of 0 0.20 means that there was a there's a 20% chance of getting an effect that big just through random sampling error, and 20% is is too big, especially when we said ahead of time that we were we had it had to happen less than 1% of the time. So A is the correct answer. We retain the null hypothesis. Uh, retesting the data set. I don't even know what that means. Um, C, reject the null hypothesis. No, we would only do that if our p-value were less than 01. So if it were like 005, that would be less than 01. Uh, choose a different alpha. That's cheating <laughs> to do that afterwards. Um, even if we took the more conventional 05, the, the point uh, for the alpha, the, the p-value of 0.20 that we got is way too big. Anyhow, um, A is the correct answer. 57. Which of the following null hypothesis statistical tests requires calculating degrees of freedom? Um, chi-square test? Yeah, actually, you do have to calculate degrees of freedom. For a chi-square test, it has to do with the number of rows and columns, um, not with the sample size. Uh, B, a two-sample t-test? Uh, yes, that's correct. You need actually uh, combine the uh, degrees of freedom for the, and it's n minus 1 for each sample, and you put them together. C, a one-sample t-test? Yes, you need the degrees of freedom for that, too, n minus 1. Uh, so the answer is D, all of the above. You need degrees of freedom for all of those. Uh, degrees of freedom also go into the analysis of variance, and they go into correlation and regression and others, but basically everything except the z-test. But anyhow, there you go. 58. In a two-sample t-test, what is the grouping variable? Um, so a two-sample t-test is used to compare the means of two groups. So the grouping variable is, is whatever defines the two groups that you're comparing. The dependent variable. No, that's the outcome variable, the thing that you're getting the means on that you're comparing them. B, the predicted mean. Well, we do have predicted means. Uh, that's usually from regression, and that certainly doesn't have anything to do with this. C, the independent variable. Yes, that is the correct answer. The independent variable defines the groups that you are comparing. So it might be, for instance, Prozac versus the placebo. Uh, it might be, um, you know, evening classes versus morning classes. It's whatever uh, groups the two people. And so the independent variable is the grouping variable. And then you look at the means on the dependent variables. Um, so C is the correct answer. And then D, the baseline for the null hypothesis. You know, uh, not even sure what that means. Anyhow, we'll skip that. All right, 59. Which of the following situations is appropriate for using a chi-squared test? OK. A, to compare average heights of male and females. No, that's means. You would probably want to use a two-sample t-test in that one. Uh, B, to examine the relationship between major and graduation status at UVU. So major is a categorical variable. It's nominal. And graduation status would mean you have or have not graduated. So they're both categorical, uh, both nominal, in fact. 
yeah, that actually would be a good situation for the chi-square test. You're looking at the distrib uh, whether the distribution of majors is different for people who've graduated and not. Um, so B is the answer. But let's just look. To compare, uh, C says to compare mean UVU sample ISQ scores with the known population mean IQ score. Well, that would be a Z test where you're comparing one sample mean to a population mean. And then D, to examine the relationship between height and weight. You'd want to use regression and correlation for that. So anyhow, the answer is B, because you're looking at the relationship between two categorical variables, uh, nominal variables in this case. All right, 60. Pooled variance is required for which test? Okay, pooled variance means that you're getting the variance from two groups, two or more groups, and you're putting it together. Um, the Z test, no, you don't use that because that's for one group and you're just using that one group's uh, and, or the, the samples of the population's variant, uh, so you don't use that. B analysis of variance, no, you don't use a pool of variance for that one. Uh, D chi-squared, no, you don't even use variance at all in that one because that's for nominal categorical variables. D, two sample T tests, yes, D is the correct answer. You have to use the pooled variance in calculating the uh, pooled standard error uh, and getting this, the standard error that's used for the two sample t-test. So 60D is the correct answer. 61, a post hoc test, that means after the fact, a post hoc test is required when the null hypothesis has been rejected for which statistical test? Uh, Chi-squared, usually not. Um, uh, ANOVA, that means analysis of variance, yes, because the analysis of variance, you can compare the means of for instance, three or four or five groups all at once. And the analysis of variance simply tells you that there is a difference somewhere in the mix. And so you it tells you, yes, there's a difference. Then you have to do the post hoc test to find out exactly where the difference is and to do a statistical test on that one. So B, ANOVA, or analysis of variance is the correct answer. Uh, Z test, you don't need a post hoc test because you're only comparing one sample to one population mean. You know exactly where the difference is. Same thing with the two sample T test. You're only two groups. There's only one difference to be looked at. All right, 62. The null hypothesis for an ANOVA, an analysis of variance, is A, all group means are statistically equal. Um, yeah, that's correct, that you're comparing several group means and that they're all the same. Um, another way of putting that is that the, vari the variance of the means is zero, so all group means are statistically equal. A is the correct answer. B, the correlation between X and Y is zero, that would be the null hypothesis for correlation or regression. Uh, C, X and Y are independent of one another. That's usually how you would word the uh, null hypothesis for a chi-square test where you're looking at the association between categorical variables. D, none of the above. No, because A is correct. Okay, let's uh, stop there and we'll pick up in the next video.